didn't start up running it up. Dude. I had to count. <laughs> Time, I, I guess I didn't, uh, it was cut off, so I just cut it off. Uh huh, chess band. Okay. I mean, I organized it some, some worship service presentations. And then, what is this one right here? Okay. What I may do is start dropping my Wednesday classes over there. Yeah. Because then you don't have to transfer with the USB. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Make sure his interview is off for this. But so now, should be good. Turn this oh, oh no, it's already it's on. Already on. It's so on. go ahead and hit AD me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. In there. We're good to go then. So I noticed when did they start doing this? When did they start putting it on the side over here? That's that's good. You know? Yeah, um, I think there were a few times where, because it, it, like, uh, you know, Ernest will close a laptop, um, mm -hmm. but you accidentally set something on here and it pushes a button, and then the slideshow gets messed up. And so if you put it over here, then. Um, although there was one time, even if it's over here, it still somehow ran my head a button push. <laughs> <laughs> I think what we need to do somehow is look for a different type of podium because this one is old. I mean, but I know there are some nicer ones too with a little platform, and that would be nice. Yeah, too. yeah. I mean, they have you can get like an extension to put, mm -hmm. but uh, well, that's something. To do, right? Yeah. Okay, so when I come up, I'll hit the A B B. Well, I don't have to. That's right. All right. Good evening, good evening, good evening, everyone. It's good to see each of you back for our Sunday evening worship service. We've had a delightful time in the Lord this morning, and we're, we're sure we're going to have continued delightful time in the Lord throughout the week. Uh, Brother Bonner has been outstanding. We know he's going to continue to be so. Uh, before we get started, I have a, a few announcements. I want to first uh, take time out to uh, welcome our visitors who are attending on this evening and also who are viewing via live stream. We're so happy to have you on this evening. A few announcements uh, that we have. I received a, a prayer request from Sister Charlotte Shaw in reference to uh, Lynn, Betty, and Jack Ford uh, asking for us to pray for them and send cards. Uh, Jack was admitted in the hospital on Thursday and is uh, scheduled to have heart surgery on tomorrow. So uh, please keep them in your prayers. Uh, if you need uh, their address to send cards, please let us know and we can give you the roster for uh, their addresses in, on that behalf. Uh, he is at Centera uh, Lee in room 431. You can visit Jack in the hospital. Also, uh, big brother Reggie Trotter, he's kind of under the weather. Uh, my daughter also is kind of under the weather. 
Uh, we spent time at the Jubilee, and the Jubilee got a hold of us. <laughs> uh, Sister Gladys Washington, uh, her son uh, Greg Parker, uh, will have surgery on Wednesday to repair a stent. So please keep uh, him in your prayers as well, and also Brother Patrick Murray, who's injured uh, his knee. As we stated, our gospel meeting uh, has kicked off and will remain uh, throughout the week. Each evening at 7.30 p.m., we'll be here at the building. Uh, so we just want to cordially invite everyone who is under the sound of my voice, uh, tell your neighbors, tell your friends to come out and worship with us uh, at the Chesapeake Church of Christ. I don't have any additional, oh, yes, I do. Have a few more prayer requests. Uh, Sister Didi Shaver's friend, Ariel, uh, is battling brain cancer, and is, she's 27 years old, and it seemed to be inoperable. Uh, so please keep her uh, in your prayers as well. At this time, I would like you to silence your portable electronic devices, uh, any devices, games, toys, that makes beeps, bloops, uh, so it won't disturb our worship service. And we'll have a moment of silence uh, before we enter uh, in the worship service. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for another opportunity to come together as believers to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we pray that everyone has come with thanksgiving in their heart. And Father, we just thank you for this body of believers and lift them up to you. Father, we pray for all those who are on our sick list and all those who have been mentioned today, Cheryl Lassiter, Patrick Murray. Please, we lift up um, Brother Trotter and Z as they're struggling with um, health problems. Father, we have a special request for, for Jack Ford, and we just pray that you'll be with him in his surgery next week. And Father, we also want to lift up Dee Dee Sharper's, um, her friend, Ariel, and be with her during her surgery. Father, we thank you for all your blessings. We just thank you for our message this evening. We've had two great messages today, and we just are anticipating another one this evening. Father, we pray that you will be with Mike Bonner as he delivers that message to us. And Father, we pray that the body will open their hearts and their mind and will use this message to examine our walk. Father, we thank you for our visitors. And most of all, Father, we just thank you for your son and all that he has done for us and all that he has made possible for us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. If you're using your books, the first hymn will be 240. We'll sing all three verses of this song. Do you have it? When the Savior calls, I will answer. When he calls for me, I will hear. When the Savior calls, I will answer. I'll be somewhere listening for his name. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Yes, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. If my heart is right when he calls me, if my heart is right, I will hear. If my heart is right when he calls me, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Yes, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. 
Yes, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. If my robe is white when he calls me, if my robe is white, I will hear. If my robe is white when he calls me, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Yes, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Yes, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Amen. Our next song will be hymn number 472, I'll Sing and Be Happy. And again, we'll sing all three verses of this song. If you have it. If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem gray all the whole day through, there's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, my friend. Trust in his promises, grand. Now sing and be happy. Press on to the gold. Trust him who leaves you. He will keep your soul. Let all be faithful, look to him and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Off we fell to troubled and tired, sick with sorrow and pain. There are others living in sin, blessed with earthly gain. Take new courage, we cannot tell what the morrow may bring. When the dark clouds vanish away, then your heart truly can sing. Now sing. And be happy, press on to the goal. Trust him who leaves you. He will keep your soul. Let all be faithful. Look to him and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Off we fell to see the rainbow up in heaven's fair sky. When it seems the fortunes of earth frowned and passed us by. There are things we know that are worth more than silver and gold. If we hope and trust them each day, we shall have pleasure untold. Now sing and be happy, press on to the gold trust. Him who leaves you, he will keep your soul. Let all be faithful, look to him and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. 
Sing and be happy today. Amen. At this time, we're going to turn our attention to the Lord's Supper for those who did not have an opportunity to partake this morning. We'll sing hymn number 383, Off We Come Together. If you have it. Off we come together, off we sing and pray, here we bring our offering on this holy day. Hell Lord, help us, Lord, help us, Lord, thy love to see. May we all in truth and spirit worship thee. May in memory all that God has said. May we truly worship as we eat the May we all in truth and spirit worship thee. May we all in spirit all with one accord. Take this cup of blessing given by the Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, thy love to see. May we all in truth and spirit worship thee. This being the first day of the week, we still have an opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper. Does everybody have a communion kit that needs one? Please raise your hand if you need one. I'd like to read Luke's account of the Lord's Supper being instituted. If you'll turn with me to Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 14. And when the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body for which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. 
Bow with me as we bless the bread. Dear God in heaven, thank you for allowing your son to come down and die on our behalf. Thank you for the sacrifice that he made for us so that we might join you in heaven. Please be with us as we partake of the bread and help us to partake of it in, in a manner pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Bow with me for the cup. Dear God in heaven, thank you for the blood that was shed on our behalf and for the remission of our sins that its washing gives us. Please be with us as we partake of the fruit of the vine and help us to remember the sacrifice made on our behalf and one day in heaven save us. In Jesus' name, amen. Separate but still a part of worship is the collection. We don't pass a collection tray around. You can give your collection in the basket in the back. You can give online or you can give your contribution online. The collection is authorized in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so must you do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay aside something, storing up as he may prosper, that there be, be no collection when I come. Bow with me as we pray for the collection. Dear God in heaven, thank you for the many blessings that you've given us, and thank you for the many things that we have in our life that are not needed. Help us remember that everything that we have is due to you and that it all belongs to you. Please be with us as we give and help us to remember to give with a cheerful heart and one day in heaven save us in Jesus' name, amen. At this time, if you'd like to mark in your hymn books this song after today's lesson, it will be hymn number 692, Softly and Tenderly, Softly and Tenderly. Our song before today's message will be Anywhere is Home, Anywhere is Home, and we'll sing all three verses of this song. If you're able, please stand for this song. <clears throat> Gab it. Earthly wealth and fame may never come to me, and a powerless Let come what may, if Christ my For his dear sake, my cross I'll meekly bear. Anywhere is home if Christ my Lord is there. Oft I'm told. About and driven by the foe, sad within, without, wherever I may go, 
but I press along till looking up in prayer for as home, sweet home, if Christ is only there. For his dare say, my cross on me leave anywhere is home if Christ my Lord is there I will lay Please be seated. Please open up your Bibles to Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord's guard the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. What a blessing it is for us again to be back on tonight as we uh, come to worship God in spirit and in truth. This is our opportunity to uh, learn more about God and be reminded of the things that 
he has stated in his holy book, the Bible, the Word of God. I'm thankful again for uh, the invitation and uh, the opportunity to stand uh, in the pulpit to be able to grace this great congregation, to be able to preach what thus saith the Lord. This week we are talking about walking in wisdom, and when we consider the great idea of wisdom, wisdom is the ability to see the end at the beginning. We understand from a Hebrew and Greek perspective, wisdom is very important. As a matter of fact, it is through wisdom that God created all things. We see wisdom personified as a female in uh, Proverbs chapter 8. We understand that Jesus, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 23 and 24, is the power and wisdom of God. And so Jesus, in a very real sense, being the word of God, was right there at the side of the Father creating. God would use the word of God as an agent to create all things. One of those great creations that God created through the word of God, through Christ, was the home. What a blessing to know that the home is the wisdom of Almighty God. No wonder Satan is doing all that he can to attack it. No wonder Satan has always attacked the home. Satan did not wait for 2,000 years to attack the home. He attacked the home in the garden, and he's been attacking the home ever since. In the beginning, when God created man and woman, we see the wisdom of God right there as he makes man from the ground. And after the man, after he named all of the animals, the man realized that he was without companion. And what did he do? God put Adam to sleep, and when he woke up, after taking a rib out of his side, man broke out in a monologue and said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken forth from the man. What a great time for Adam at that particular time to see that all of the animals had someone, uh, something as a companion, but he had no one. When we stop and we consider the wisdom of God, God would say in Genesis 2 and verse number 18 that it's not good for man to be alone. We understand that to be in relationship. Man should have relationships. Man should have relationships that are good for his well-being, to help him to see who God is, to help him to see who he is. When we consider Adam and Eve, God would place a focal point for Adam and Eve in the garden. That would be the tree of life. It would be through that tree that Adam would know who God was and is. We understand that the tree would represent God, his knowledge. God would give man the opportunity to make choices. God has always given man the opportunity to make choices because God has always wanted man to make the right choice. And when man would make the right choice, he would be in fellowship with God. But if man did not make the right choice, he would be out of fellowship with God. We understand that as it relates to 1 John 3, 20 and 21. God would have fellowship with mankind in the cool of the day. He would walk in the midst of the garden, Genesis 3 and verse number 8. That demonstrates to us that God is a God of relationships that God is not aloof, that God is not afar off, not knowing what is going on with that which he has created. As a matter of fact, God knows everything that is going on on the earth. 
The Bible would demonstrate to us in the book of Psalm, I believe it's Psalm 103 or Psalm 113, that God stoops down in order to behold the heavens and the earth, to see what's going on on the earth. God himself knows exactly what is going on. In Genesis 2 and verse number 15, God will give man opportunity to work. God has never wanted man to be lazy. He's always wanted man to have some type of occupation, if you will. I'm reminded of what Jesus said in John 9 and verse number 4, I must work the works of him uh, while it is day, for when man, when night come, no man can work. God is a worker. Jesus is a worker. The Holy Spirit had a work. The apostles had work. The church has work. And guess what? We still have work to do. And so God is a God of working. And so he gave man a job, gave him a job to till the garden, if you will, to tend, tend to the garden, rather. Why is that? Because he's always wanted man to feel accomplished and fulfilled in his labor. But then we understand that God wanted man again to be relational. In Genesis 2, 24 and 25, when we stop and we think about the wisdom of God, it's so beautiful to know that God demonstrates his wisdom through the home, through the family. When we consider the home, again, it is the wisdom of God for the world from a spiritual perspective. The home would demonstrate the beauty of oneness and an opportunity to be united in the home to the world. The home would show the world the need for dependence upon God and one another. The home would exemplify the forgiveness and long-suffering needed in order to strive and to thrive. The home. The home would be God's moral culture and example to the church and the world at large. Hmm. God's moral culture to the church is the home. God's moral culture to the world is the church. And no wonder God uses the church in order to be a moral culture, watch it now, in the midst of an immoral world. And so when we consider the wisdom of God, we see the home as it relates to the man and the woman. Did you hear what I just said? Y'all know where I'm going. Unfortunately, Satan has attacked the home. He has attacked the home in so many different ways that now he's attacking the home in such a diabolical way where now men and women are identifying as something that they're not. Friends, that's an attack on the home. We can grow soft all we want to and say that man has a choice to identify as what he or she desires, but man doesn't have that choice. Why is that? Because of XX and XY chromosomes. We understand that you can probably get to cutting things off, but you can't cut off XX and XY. Why is that? Because that's on the inside. God put DNA and RNA inside of the human, and the devil can't touch that. The devil can't touch the DNA and RNA. The devil can't touch the soul, even though man can be so twisted in his mind to think that he can identify as something that he is not. That is not the wisdom of God. As a matter of fact, that is degradation, that is demonic, and that is sin. Yeah, I said it. Some of us, even in the Lord's church, are refraining from saying it. But we have to speak the whole counsel of God. And so, number one, I want us to talk about the home and the fear of the Lord. When we stop and we think about the home, why should the home be so important? The home is important, brethren, because of the fear of the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 1 and verse number 7, we know that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fools despise wisdom and instruction. Friends, when we consider the fear of the Lord, it is the fear of the Lord that God desires for all homes to choose. Proverbs 2 and verse number 29. It is the fear of the Lord that should be taught in the home. If not, look at Psalm 36 and verse number 1. This will take place. Turn your Bibles there. Don't look at me. I know I might be good looking, but you better look at your Bible. You come here to look at the Bible, to read the Bible, to study the Bible, the word of God. In Psalm 36 and verse number one, why do men sin? Why is the home in shambles? Why do men do what they want to do? They don't believe that they're going to stand before God and give an answer. The Bible here demonstrates to us an oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked. There is no fear of God before his eyes. Why do men sin? They don't fear God. 
They don't fear God. The home must be a place where the fear of the Lord is taught. In Proverbs 29 and verse number 15, we understand that children must be taught to fear the Lord. If not, they'll bring shame to their mother. You know, this is true for the wife. This is true for the husband. This is why a husband and a wife should not be left alone too long. Why? Because you don't want what happened to them to happen to Eve in the garden. Better watch that, sw- that snake talk, young ladies. Watch the snake talk. Why is that? Because Satan loves to get us by ourselves, secluded, even to the point where we're finding ourselves wandering off in our minds. This is why we got to keep things reined in as the people of God. The home must... must The home must make sure that they keep things reined in. Why is that? Because if you're alone too long, you'll find yourself in trouble. This is even for single folk. For single people, you have to make sure that your mind and your body is pure. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 34, and also verse 35. Friends, the home is where the fear of the Lord begins. And so if Satan can attack the home and get the home off track and get them to not see the fear of the Lord, the respect of the Lord, the reverence of the Lord, guess what happens to the home? It begins to disintegrate. It begins to go off track. It begins to make up its own rules as it goes. Friends, we can't make up our own rules as the Lord's church As Christians, as people of God, we have the responsibility to make sure that the fear of the Lord is in the home. There's such great blessings with the fear of the Lord. Such great blessings. What are some of the blessings? Look at Proverbs chapter 2. Look at verses 5 and 6. I wish I had till midnight, but I don't. (laughs) Paul preached at midnight. One smart aleck brother said, but he started at 1130. I'm just telling you what he said. I didn't say it was true. <laughs> In Proverbs 2, verses 5 and 6, notice what the Bible here demonstrates. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Guess what God offers us in with the fear of the Lord? He offers us stability. Why are so many homes unstable today? Could it be that there is no fear of the Lord in the home? What do you mean by the fear of the Lord? You keep saying that, meaning that God is not reverenced. That all the decisions that we make, they're going to be funneled through the word of God. They're going to be filtered through the word of God. We're going to ask God, what does God have to say about the question that you have? That dance that you want to go to. That person that you want to date that's not a Christian, but they're constantly leading you astray. The home. You know, the mother, the father, the grandmother, the grandfather, the caretaker have the responsibility that if you're going to bring children into this world, you have a responsibility to teach them to fear the Lord. Why is that? Psalm 127, the children, children don't belong to us, brethren. They are inheritance of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is the Lord. Therefore, the children belong to the Lord. The womb belongs to the Lord. And no man has the responsibility or the right to go up inside of a womb and rip a baby out of it. The womb don't belong to you. Keep your hands out of the womb. Let the baby come out of the womb like it's supposed to. And come out alive. If that's the Lord's will. Proverbs 9 and verse number 10. The fear of the Lord provides and prolongs life through good decisions. It gives children places to run to. But look at Proverbs 28 verse number 14. I love this in the King James rendering. Proverbs 28, verse number 14. Notice what the Bible here says in Proverbs 28, verse number 14. Happy is the man who is always reverent, but he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. The King James renders it a little differently. Happy is he that is always fearful. You know, happiness in the home comes when you fear God. When you do things his way, when you understand his way of life. It brings happiness to the home. It's a great treasure to the people of God. The home deserves the best. So what did God give the home? He gave the home the word of God. Gave it guidance. Can't 
I can't understand when people say, well, children don't come with a handbook. You know, that's the wisdom of man. Oh, it is diabolical for someone to give you a task and not tell you how to do the task. It's diabolical for God to give us children, but not a handbook on how to rear them. It's diabolical for the Lord to allow us to marry one another, but not give us a book on how to treat one another, to love one another, to respect one another, to even die for one another. That's diabolical to think that way. God is not diabolical. God is righteous. And because he is righteous, friends, we know that he has given us the fear of the Lord. He has given us his word that guides and directs us and helps us to be the people that he desires for us to be. The home. What shouldn't the home have in it? Let me give you four quick passages. Number one, 1 John 3, verse number four. Just put these in your notes. I'll come back to them maybe later on this week. 1 John 5, verse 17. It's another one. James 4, verse number 17. Let me give you those three for right now. You stop and you think about sin. Sin is transgression of God's law. All unrighteousness is sin. He that knoweth to do it good and doeth it not to him is sin. Why do we say that? Sin and foolishness must be discouraged in the home, and the fear of the Lord must be exercised. Brethren, friends, if you have children in the home, then you ought to be making sure that sin and foolishness is not being exercised in the home. Don't compromise. Walk in wisdom, which means that when you have sin in the home, you want to hurry up and get it out of your home as quick as possible with the wisdom of God. So you go to the word of God and you address the problem with the word of God. So how do I do that? We'll talk about that here in a minute. But sin is transgression of God's law. All unrighteousness is sin. He that knoweth to do it good and doeth it not it, it, to him it is sin. Romans 14, 23, add that one to your, to your list. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. But Mike, what do you mean? What's going on here? What are we talking about? Brendan, we're talking about the fear of the Lord. And when sin enters the home, then you're going to have problems. One thing we used to tell our children, you watch what you put in your mind because what you put in your mind when you're young, you got to deal with it when you get old. Amen. Y'all know y'all still got some of those songs in your mind that shouldn't be in your mind. I ain't heard that in 20 years. That's what happens when you put stuff in your mind. It don't go nowhere. It's going to always be there. This is why, friends, when we think about these and these and things that enter into our home, in our day, it was the television and radio, but now it's a little bit of everything. Watch what your children are watching. Train your children to have a conscience towards God. That's to fear the Lord. And so when they see something or hear something that is diametrically opposed to the word and will of God, then they will respond instead of you have to Walk in on them. Amen. Friends, I have five children. The oldest is 31. The youngest is 22. All of them are faithful to the Lord right now. Right now. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But as of right now. But it's a constant struggle. It's a constant battle. Mom and dad still talking to them all the time. Reasoning with them. Contending with them. John 16, 8. Why? Because Satan is attacking them just like he's attacking us. The home. I don't know who lied to us by saying, well, when your children turn 18, they're out of your hair. They're out of your business. You don't have to worry about them no more. That's a lie. Because if you love your children, you're going to never give up on them. If you love your children, you're going to always be in a position of leadership and counsel. Now, a young man may get married and have their own home. He's the head of his own house. You're not his head. You're not controlling him, but you are still a source of counsel, yes, wisdom, to give them understanding. Reminds me of the days of Moses when he had too much going on in his life in Exodus chapter 18. And here come Jethro, his father-in-law, giving him wise counsel. Shouldn't we put ourselves in the position to do that? Wisdom, friends, have great benefits. Seven things I want to give you that I believe will help you in the home. 
Number one, teach the family, your family, to depart from evil and foolishness. Teach them that. Warn them of the evil and the dangers of sin and where it will lead you, Job 28 and 28. How do I know that I fear God? How do I know that I reverence Lord? The fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. When I understand God's will, then I stay away from sin. 2 Timothy 2 and verse number 19. Leave sin alone, number two, and strive for righteousness. Leave sin alone. The fear of the Lord teaches me to leave sin alone. I see it coming. Every man is drawn away by their own lust. Every man is enticed by something. But that does not mean that I have to fall prey to it. It does not mean that the family has to fall prey to sin. If anything, we're running away from sin. We're not trying to get as close as possible. We're trying to get as far away from sin as possible. That's the home. Oh, if the world can see the home, the church can see individual families removing sin out of their lives by growing in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If they can just see that, oh, it will permeate. They will see, hmm, they're different. Number three, leaving sin and foolishness is insufficient. Righteousness must be pursued and followed. It's not enough to just leave sin alone. You got to run after God. It's not enough to just leave drinking alone, drugs alone, sex alone. Now you got to run after God and keep your mind and your body pure. Intentional. The fear of the Lord is intentional, brethren. The home is intentional. God intentionally made the home for what purpose? To fear him, to honor him, to glorify him, to walk in his wisdom. Number four, the fear of the Lord corrects and disciplines. Hmm. Not harshly, but intentionally. Notice Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11. I set my timer for 30 minutes. I don't know if I'm going to do that. Maybe I was a little tired when I got up here. Now I'm a little energized. I might go a little longer. We'll see. In Ecclesiastes 8, verse number 11, notice this principle. Our country have left this principle alone and it's killing us now. In Ecclesiastes 8 and verse number 11, notice what the Bible says, because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, the hearts of the son of men is fully set in them to do evil. Isn't that right? What, the, what does that teach me? That as a parent, and I see my child not doing something that is right or something detrimental to their soul, something that's going to cause harm, something that violates the will of God's son. Come here, let's talk. It does not mean that I take my belt immediately and spank him. My mom taught me something and I really appreciate it. She said, son, you got to teach him before you spank him. We got too many parents, especially in the world, they're spanking and not even teaching. How do you know? How do we know what to do? Friends, we deal with things when they show up, when they pop up. My wife and I was talking about this the other day. She said, one thing that I really have to work on is watching my attitude when people do things and they expect me to let it go. Sometimes brethren expect you to let stuff go. And then when you get upset and mad, now you're ready to deal with it. You know God expects us to deal with things as they pop up. You know, you just can't allow sin to just run rapid in your life. You need to deal with every sin every single time. You know what we need to teach our children when they do something that's not right? That they need to be taught to fear the Lord. They need to be taught that that's not right. Why? Because it violates God. Every sin is against God. It's not that you disappointed me. It's not that you disappointed your dad. You disappointed God. And we just want you to get that right. Guess what you are doing when you are rearing your little ones to do that? You are developing within them a conscience. A conscience of what? Of the fear of the Lord. The wisdom that is in the home is to fear the Lord. Number five, the home should be a place of balance where compassion, mercy, and forgiveness, sternness, and stability, and truth lives. The home. Well, Brother Mike, all my children are gone, and I didn't do none of those things. What can I do? I don't know. 
For some of us, it is too late because some of our children are so far out there they don't even want to come back. But maybe you can say something to them. You know, sometimes it requires you just saying, I'm sorry, I messed up. Mm -hmm. I had to do that with a couple of my kids. It's no testimonial. I'm just telling you what happened. Isn't that what we do with the father? Father, I'm sorry I messed that up. One thing God never has to do is tell us he's sorry because he never does anything wrong toward us. But as human fathers, we do things that are not right sometimes. And we have to have the fear of the Lord. That's teaching our children. It's all right for you to say, I'm sorry. Number six, parents must teach their children through righteous consistency and the need to respect God. Number seven, respecting authority. You know, if children are not respecting their own parents, why do we expect them to respect authority outside? My wife is a teacher. <laughs> I know. It's horrible. It is. It's horrible. Children don't have any respect for authority. But Evelyn said, that's not really my problem. My problem is the adults that don't have respect for the authority. The Church of Christ should always respect authority. Homes in the church should always respect authority. Why is that? Because we're all under the authority of Jesus Christ. And so whatever we do in word or deed, we do all in the name of Jesus Christ. Look at Psalm 127. And Psalm 127, there are a few things I want us to demonstrate. I appreciate the reading. I want us to notice something. The home and the wisdom of God. It's the Lord that builds the house. In this context, he's talking about the home. Some brethren erroneously use this as for the church. No, he's talking about the home. He's talking about the home. If you look at verse number one, unless the Lord establishes, builds the house, the family, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards, keeps the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. In verse number one, we understand that God is the one that establishes the home. Man doesn't have a right to destroy the home. Satan is coming in and ripping the home apart. Friends, brethren, the church, we need to make sure that we stand up for our homes. How do we stand up for the home? By keeping the word of God in the middle of it, in the center of it, making sure that God is respected. And I find it interesting that when when God is rejected, man is respected. And when man, when God is respected, man is respected. You get that when you get home. Friends, we don't want to disrespect the Lord. But notice verse number three. We got to have a proper view of children. A proper view of children. Behold, children are an heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. We stop and we think about God and we think about children. How do you see your children? Do you see your children as a pain, as a burden? I remember my uncle, who was an elder in the Lord's church, said, Mike, you got all five of these kids here, and I know they're a burden to you right now, but if you raise them right, they'll be a blessing. You know what? He was right. I know children are tough. One of the hardest things you'll ever do is be a parent. Why? Because you're dealing with the conscience and the souls of another individual who has free will and God wants you to mold that will. But you got to have a proper view of that child. You have to have precision in spiritual, emotional, social, and economic guidance. Look at verse 4. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Hmm. It is the father that actually guides the children where they need to go. Hold on. I thought the, the mother spends more time with the children. But the man, it's interesting that God put the man as the leader. I'm reminded of Luke chapter 1 and verse number 17 and how God sends John the Baptist, the immerser, and he sends them to the fathers. Why? To turn the hearts of the fathers toward the children and the children toward their fathers. Friends, God has always wanted the man to be the leader. 
He's the one that's pointing them in the right direction. And guess what Satan has done for years? He's taken the man out of the home. And in America, it seemed like it's all right to make babies and not rear them up. And we have all these kids out here, and it don't matter what color they are. When you find a man not in the home, you'll find children running rampant. Because God has always wanted men to be the spiritual leaders in the home. Verse 5, children are precious, and they deserve spiritual leadership. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. You know, there's nothing wrong with having a lot of kids. You know, in the church, we ought to watch our mouth when people start having a lot of kids. We shouldn't say, don't you have a TV? You know, they used to say that. You know, God loves a bunch of kids. And when a man and a woman gets married, they do it right, and they have a bunch of kids, and they're bringing them up in the nurturing admonition of the Lord. They're putting the Spirit of God into the minds of them through the Word of God. God loves that because he has all of this influence in the world. We should never say you have too many kids, especially if you're teaching them the Word of God. You see what happens? Satan has a lot of kids out here now. And it's unfortunate that we see that they're not being reared up in the ways of God. Look at Ecclesiastes 4. There's so much in Ecclesiastes. I appreciate y'all being patient. I know y'all didn't fly me 2,000 miles to speak 20 minutes anyway. Ecclesiastes has so much to say, we'll summarize it with a few passages. The home should be a place of friendship, a place of camaraderie. We see the wisdom of God and how even the Godhead, Brother Dismuth, we was talking this morning about even in the Godhead, they're composite, different yet one. We have the authority of the Father, we have the word of God on the right hand, and we have the Holy Spirit, yet they're all divinity. Yet they have different names, Jehovah, the word of God, spirit. We see the home the same way. You have the man, he's the leader, he's the head. You have the wife, and she is the one in support, in submission. And you have the children, and you have camaraderie. In verse number nine of Ecclesiastes chapter four, two are better than one. Oh, have a lot of kids, brethren. Why? So you can teach them how to work together. So you can teach them camaraderie. So you can teach them the word and the will of God and how God himself works with one another. There's never no power struggle in the Godhead. It should not be a power struggle in the husband-wife relationship. It should not be any power struggle amongst the kids. Matthew 18, who's the greatest? Y'all remember that, right? You remember the response of the 10? And they were dismayed. They were upset. They were angry. And Jesus would use that situation for the rest of the book of Matthew from 18 to the end as it relates to stumbling. Here we see that the 10 were stumbling because the two wanted to be the greatest. The home, if we exercise the wisdom of God, we don't show partiality. One is not greater than the other. I told a young lady just the other day with her baby, I said, your baby is no better than any other's baby. Yeah, I said that. Sure did. Brother Mike, what do you mean? That's my baby. It don't matter. Because if you see someone else's baby, you're going to treat them just as good. You're going to show them respect. You're going to show them care. Why is that? Because if you teach your children that, then they're going to grow up and have respect for all men, not y'all men. You get that when you get home. 
And so in verse number nine, two is better than one. Help is available in verse number 10. Friendship is developed. In verse number 11, we see resources that are shared. In verse number 12, they're not easily broken up. The last thing you want, hear me out, brethren, is to find that your child is addicted to whatever and they felt all alone because there was no one there. Amen. You know, you need to be teaching your children you can come to me with anything. I might not like it, but I'm going to help you with it. Or if you're tempted with something that is possibly going to take you off before you allow it to take you off, come talk to me. Talk to me. Isn't that ironic that the relationship we have with the Father in heaven through Jesus Christ, our Lord, is the same way that we go to God and we cast all our cares upon him while he cares for us? And so why is that? God never wants his people to get so engulfed in sin, so wrapped up in sin, that they can't come to him. So what does he do? He gives us a family. And what does he call that family? He calls it the church. And so you're never alone. I can confess my faults one to another. I can pray with my brother. He can pray with me. She can pray with me. And that needs to be cultivated in the home. It makes no sense when a child has a mother and a father and brothers and sisters and they feel all alone at home. There's no wisdom in that. And so, if you look at verse number 12, look at it again, brethren. When we stop and we consider this two better than one, though one be, may be overpowered by another, Two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Threefold? Hold on. Father, Son, and Spirit? Hold on. The husband, the wife, and God? Hold on. When children come into this world, guess what? It's supposed to be threefold. Why? A mother and daddy and a child. A child should never have to come into this world without a daddy. Why? Because that's not the wisdom of God. Now don't tell me God can make that thing work. But if that child is here, it took, it took a mama and a daddy. And so God has always wanted that child to have the protection and the security and the teaching that he or she needed in order to thrive and strive and be what he desires, to never be alone last thing you want is to be alone when you are trampled by sin. Look at Ecclesiastes 5. Powerful thoughts. Verses 1 through 7, not going to read this, but it's, I find it interesting that the wisdom of God in the home, it teaches that when you make a covenant, when you give an oath, you keep it. God forbid if we sign papers on any type of debt that we think that we can walk away from that debt. We don't teach our children that. We teach them that if you sign your name on something, you give your word, you pay it back. Friends, those are principles. And those principles are the wisdom of God. Look at verses 18 through 20 of the same chapter. We should be teaching our children work ethic. It is not acceptable for you as a mother and a father to let your child do nothing all day long. That's not acceptable. Why is that? Because in Christ, you can't sit by yourself and you can't sit aloof. You can't sit idle. God always wants his people working. Even to the point that you're working out your salvation with fear and trembling. Look at verses 18 through 20. Friends, I ain't smart enough to make this up. Look what he says. Here is what I have seen. It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor in which he toils under the sun all the days of his life, which God gives him. For it is his portion, his heritage. Notice verse 19. As for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth and given him power to eat of it, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labors, this is the gift of God. Hold on. Look at verse 20. Wow. For he will not dwell unduly on the days of his life because God keeps him busy with the joys of his heart. Brother Mike, what is, what is Solomon saying? 
that when you work hard on your job, that's a gift of God. You feel accomplished. You get things done. And this is why you ought to give your children chores at home. This is why wives need to make sure that they're doing their work at home. And husbands, you go and you do your work at home. And when you get home, don't sit on that couch and do nothing all day. Ask your wife, what does she need? <laughs> Remember on a couple of occasions coming home like, Mike? I know you've been at work all day, but I'm tired. Can you help me out a little bit? <laughs> Just get mad. Sit on my chair mad. After a while, I, I woke up. Y'all corner me and ask me why I woke up later. Just corner me and ask me, and I'll tell you. I ain't going to tell you right now. <laughs> but I woke up. Because she deserved better. Yeah, I worked hard all day, but you know what's hard? Having children at home. And lots of our women today are leaving home, leaving work to go to work. It's not a sin for a woman to work outside of her home. Proverbs 31 teaches that. But if you have children, I think you would want to influence your children more than anyone else. Amen. Who's influencing your children? Last but definitely not least, it's last though, the home and the beautiful roles. Don't have time to look at all of this, but I want us to look at Ephesians chapter 5. And I want us to consider Titus chapter 2 and verse number 4 and 5. We understand that the husband-wife relationship is vitally important. And Christ likens that unto the church. As a matter of fact, he would say, this is a great mystery, but I'm speaking of Christ in his church. But he brings up the home. He brings up the husband-wife relationship, the home. You may not have children, but if you have a husband, you have a wife, you have a home. Why? Because we see submission in verse 22. We see love in verse number 25. We see falling in rank. We see welcoming and entertaining the word agape there. Husbands, agape your wife. Husband, entertain your wife. Husband, welcome your wife. Husbands, draw them close. That's the wisdom of God. It's not enough for a man to say, I work. That ought to be enough. I'm showing you I love you. That's not charming. It's not. But most, even our sisters have to deal with that. I wish I could tell you how many wives I study with and their husbands are just not the people that they need to be. Ain't no wisdom in that. It's wisdom from below. Some of the best studies I have is with Evelyn Bonner. Brethren, study with your wives. Amen. Maybe I need to say it 10 more times. Study with your wives. I got a study buddy in my own house. Mm -hmm. Study with your wives. Preachers, study with your wives. Don't study with everybody, but don't study with your wife. Study with your wife. Because when you study with her and you empower her, embolden her, encourage her, guess what? Your home is better. And she'll call you Lord with a little L. Y'all get that? You know, Sarah called Abraham Lord. Little L. Y'all been looking at that text. It's little L. Olivia, remember? Evelyn called me Lord with a little L. I say, don't call me that. That's what you are. You little L Lord. I can't call you big L Lord. I say, yeah, you got a point. Good night. <laughs> but seriously, wives, make yourself available to study with your husbands. Why? That demonstrates respect. You want to get close? Study together. Pray together. Love one another. That's the wisdom of God. Look at Titus chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. You don't have time to study with your wife, then you don't, you're wasting a lot of time. What, what does study look like? 
text message studies, talking about concepts, talking about ideas, talking about words, opening up your Bible. It varies. Having a Bible study with your wife doesn't mean that we're opening up the Bible some, all the time. We can be in the car. Hey, remember so-and-so said that? Look that up in your Blue Letter Bible or in your Strong's. Look that up real quick. And next thing you know, you're talking about it and being enriched. Wisdom of God. Young people, if you're not married and you want a good husband, a good wife, make sure that they want to spend time with God and you. Titus chapter 2, verse number 4 and 5. Notice what Paul tells Titus to do. And I'm done, I promise you. Look what he says here. He gives admonition to the older women to do something to the younger women, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children. I find it interesting. That word love is not agapeo. It has phila as the prefix, phila andros, phila tecna. It has a brotherly in front of the man, a brotherly in front of the children. The word literally means to be fond of. Hmm, that's interesting. Men usually love their wives right off the bat. It's that woman that has to learn how to love that joker. Mm -hmm. That's true. I find that very interesting. Why? Because when you think of the church, Jesus loves the church. But we as the church, we have to grow in our love toward the Christ. And how do we do that? By keeping his commandments. The more we keep the commandments of the Lord, the more we demonstrate how much we love him. Here, Paul tells the older women, teach the younger women how to be fond of their husbands, to be friendly toward them. There's some sisters that just mean to their husbands. Don't be like that. That's not the wisdom of God. That's not the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is allowing that joker to say some things he ain't got no business saying. And when you get him home, be like, you know, you have to say that publicly. That's good application right there, right? For some reason, he thinks he can just say whatever he wants to to me. No, 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 no. Baby, watch your mouth, because if you keep doing that, I'm not going to like you. That's true. <laughs> let me, let me, I'm done, because y'all look at me, <laughs> folks squirming. <laughs> That's the truth, brethren. The fear of the Lord must be in the home. And so you teach your wife how to, to love you. But how do you do that? By demonstrating to her true respect. Welcoming her, entertaining her, helping her to see that she's numero uno, number one. Why? Because just as the church of Christ, Jesus don't have side shots. He don't have sanchas. He don't have women on the side. He don't have denominationalism. He has the church. That's all he got. That's man coming up with all these scenarios and ideas. No, no, Jesus got one bride. It's the bride of Christ. It's the church of Christ. It's the temple of God. That's all he has. And so with that being said, that woman has to feel and know she's numero uno. She's number one. She has deference. So when you see the fear of the Lord in the home, that is the greatest evangelism piece that God put on the face of the earth. The home. <laughs> y'all do what y'all want to with that. It's true. You know why? Because if you can see the home and it's operating and working correctly, you'll see respect, you'll see love, you'll see submission, you'll see honor, you'll see glory, you'll see stability, you see confidence, you see all of those things in the home. And guess what we don't see? We don't see those things and Satan is tearing the country up. Telling, tearing the church up. But there's always a remnant. There's always a few doing what God says. So, do your part in making sure that the wisdom of God stay inside your house. Is it going to be perfect? No. 
but it can be as close as possible. I'm a hunter. I'm done, but I'm a hunter. I never put my scope away from the target. Hold on, hold on. The deer is over there. Pow! Man, I didn't hit it. Right. <laughs> That's right. You ain't going to hit it. Why? Because I got to point it that way. Pow! Ooh. What we eating, baby? About to go skin this thing. We about to go eat. Your home has to be the same way. You got to be at least pointed toward the target. And if you just barely miss it, fine. Make it right. But you can't be pointing somewhere else thinking you're going to hit God's target. Let's have a word of prayer. I'll offer the invitation. Great God and Father, you're so good to us for this. We're thankful. And we love you for that, Father. We love you for your wisdom. The wisdom in the home. We pray to Father that we'll always strive to be the people that you've called us to be in the home. To walk in wisdom in the home. To demonstrate the true respect and love that you deserve and that you want inside the home. Pray to Father that we'll realize that the home is your, the greatest evangelism piece that you have because it demonstrates all of the goodness of, of you, Father. We pray that, Father, that everyone would make up their mind to do that which is right, to make things as right as possible, Father. Father, we know that's all you ask. We pray for those who may not know your son for the pardoning of their sins. Maybe their homes are in shambles. Help us, dear Father, to sit down and study with them, to demonstrate the true love of God, the true love of you, our Father, which is in heaven. And Father, we ask that you be with this congregation in a very special way, that every home represented will do their part. If they need to repent, let them repent. Pray they repent, that they may turn away from not honoring you and referencing you and fearing you to begin doing those things that are right and bringing forth fruit worthy of repentance. We love you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're not a child of God, we want you to be. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Be willing to repent of your sins. Confess Christ to be Lord. Being buried in water for the remission of your sins. You go down with him. You come up with him. You're not alone. One thing that I love about God and his plan, studying the book of Colossians right now, and when a person submits their will to the Christ, to the Father, they go down in that water and they come in contact with the blood of Christ. That blood cleanses their conscience from dead works. Now they can serve God and they come up with the Christ. You're not alone. Be faithful even to the point of death. God will give the crown of life. Maybe a child of God and you haven't been walking according to the wisdom of God. Your home is in shambles even though you're in Christ. Turn around. Start by telling God you're sorry. Start by telling your children, I'm sorry. Can we start rebuilding? Because one thing you ought to love about God, he's in the rebuilding business. And something can be in shambles. And God can rebuild it if you allow him to. But you're going to have to submit. And you're going to have to go through the bumps and the bruises because you didn't get in this thing overnight and you ain't going to get out overnight. But you can get out. As we stand and as we sing the Savior's invitation. Softly and Watching for you and for me, come home, come home, ye who are weary, come
Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and he not his mercy? Mercy for you and for me. Come home. Come home. Ye who art weary, come home. prayer we have one announcement uh brother we'd like to add brother glenn landrum the father of laura singleton's to the prayer list glenn is battling cancer uh the doctor's not sure yet how far it has progressed but glenn uh, is uh steve and liz's uh, also grandfather let us pray Dear God in heaven, we give you thanks today for the blessings that you've given us for life and for health and for strength. Most of all, we give you thanks for Jesus who shed his blood on Calvary's cross and made the sacrifice for our sin and given his life. We thank you tonight, brother, dear God, for Brother Bond and his dedication to preaching the gospel. We pray that those things that we've heard tonight, that they've fallen on good ground, that they might go, go, come up to the glory and edification of you, and that we might be always uh, aware of those things that you told us and taught us in your word about how to run our homes, that our homes might be stronger that in, and also that being our homes being stronger that we might also help build up the church. Thank you for all you do for us. We give you thanks for all those who've come tonight. We pray for their safe travel back to their destinations and be with us until we come again, meet again rather. This we ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen.